bad movie beatdown. And Snipes Month continues this week as we look at the film that completely torched his career, Blade Trinity. In case you're not familiar with Blade, here's the gist. Snipes plays a vampire hunter named Blade, whose mother was attacked by a vampire while she was pregnant. The child ended up having the vampire's strengths, including super strength and agility and increased healing, as well as those of humans, like being able to walk in the daylight, hence the nickname the Daywalker. Unfortunately, he also shares one of their weaknesses, their bloodlust, which he has to deal with through injection and chemicals and occasionally manifests itself in the rather sadistic ways that he sometimes dispatches his opponents. The Blade movies were huge hits and came at a time when Snipes' career was on the ropes, so these were pretty much the only things that were keeping him an A-lister. Snipes had a reputation for being difficult to work with and that became increasingly clear as he got hired for less and less studio films and ended up making smaller independent movies around the start of the millennium. He had already started to dip into direct video territory toy with Liberty Stands Still and Unstoppable, not to be confused with the Denzel Washington movie, by the time 2004's third installment in the franchise came out, his career really needed a boost. So you think Snipes would endeavour to make the best movie possible, right? WRONG! Blade Trinity had perhaps one of the most notoriously troubled shoots in recent memory. Snipes was really, really not happy about the final product and actually sued New Line Cinema, the studio who made the series, alleging they hadn't paid him his fee, that there was racism on the set, and despite the fact that he had script approval, they only allowed him to see it a few weeks before the shoot. He didn't promote the movie either, instead going straight into the Bulgarian shoot for seven seconds. By contrast, in contrast, however, I found a revealing expose by a journalist who had been sent to write an article on the film's production. In this piece, it claims that Snipes acted like a spoiled child throughout the entire production, and basically sabotaged the film by only coming onto the set for close-ups before going back to his trailer to smoke weed for days on end. The cast and crew majorly pissed off with Snipes' prima donna behaviour, but still trying to make the best movie possible, had to shoot around him, using Snipes' body double and then trying to use CGI to put Snipes' head on top. Also, it seems that Snipes was a bit racist himself, reportedly referring to co-star Ryan Reynolds by that term of endearment cracker. I also found another claim that Snipes had threatened to kill director David S. Goyer, who had wrote all three Blade films. And boy does that behind the scenes troll show up in the final product. So let's take a look at Blade Trinity, mostly focusing on the extended version. The movie sets the tone with an immature bit of narration. In the movies, Dracula wears a cape, and some old English guy always manages to save the day at the last minute with crosses and holy water. But everybody knows the movies are full of shit. The truth is, it started with Blade, and it ended with him. The rest of us were just along for the ride. What started with Blade? The story of Dracula vampire hunting itself? Does this narration even have a point? Mr. Reynolds is clearly not referring to the first scene of the movie, as we see a group of vampires fly out to a temple in the Syrian desert. Without Blade, obviously. And one of them middle fingers the sun in his protective garb. It's clear from these juvenile bits of humour that this movie is being targeted towards particularly stupid adolescents. Amongst these vampires is Parker Posey's Danica, WWE's Triple H as, well, Triple H, let's not pretend here, and this guy with a weird face. Seriously, that guy, ugh, he creeps me out. Guys? we go. I thought he'd look much better with that head. Dracula continues his assault on the vampires by trying to kill any epileptics watching this movie as well. I wasn't aware I was watching the film's trailer. The extended version has a new scene at this point that completely kills the pacing with this vampire themed episode of talk radio that is completely unnecessary. So let's do what the theatrical version does and skip right into the action scene where Blade does what he does best, blowing up vampires but it's not long before those production troubles show their head. Stonebridge Overpass. Yep, that's right. Wesley Snipes didn't do any ADR for this film. This is Seagal level bad, but at least he didn't pull this shit in a major theatre. 
theatrical release! And Whistler is back, played by Chris Christopherson, who provides Blade a car for a chase scene as he follows the vampires. And even in this action scene, I'm not entirely sure whether Blade is finding this all very routine, or that's just Snipes' apathy spilling over to what we're seeing. He takes out the majority of the bad guys and crashes their car, and regardless of the fact that there's a crowd of people in full view, continues his killing spree. <laughs> Staked you with silver. Why aren't you Ash? Why aren't you smarter? Not a vampire. Dumb shit! He's especially a dumb shit because we've established that Blade is smarter than this already. In the opening sequence of the first film, he managed to tell a human apart despite him being covered in blood and surrounded by vampires. And yet here he gets fooled by fake teeth and barely seems to give a crap. It turns out this was all a ruse by the vampires to set up Blade. Although they really didn't need to do that considering he was killing people in full view of the public anyway. In the previous films, he usually killed in spaces like nightclubs and so forth, so there was an air of secrecy about it. I know the in-movie explanation is that Blade is getting reckless and sloppy, but I don't buy that for a second. And if anyone's getting sloppy around here, it's Goya for not writing a convincing motivation for the plot. There's also a fairly clumsy scene around this point, which is even more overlong and out of place than the extended cut, where a bunch of vampires try to attack a woman with a baby, but it's actually Jessica Biel! She plays Whistler's daughter Abigail, but we don't know that at this point. We don't know anything about her! Sure, she becomes a main character later on, but this has nothing to do with anything that's happening right now in the plot! If this was meant to introduce her character, all that we learned is that she's some tough girl stereotype who kills vampires using a lightsaber. Yeah, that was worth spending five minutes on. Just tell us about her when she becomes important. And if it wasn't already clear that the magic's gone, then the limited interactions between Whistler and Blade should certainly clue you in. It's clear both Christopherson and Snipes are none too happy about the film, and their performances show a complete lack of effort. As far as the rest of the world's concerned, you're public enemy number one. Didn't notice it was a popularity contest. Now it's not just vampires we gotta worry about. We're gonna have to take on the rest of the world too. You worry too much. I've been doing this since before you were born, Blade. You're like a son to me. I'm sorry I got old on you. I see you alone, surrounded by enemies. And it breaks my heart. This is meant to be a big emotional scene, and yet it's flatter than a table read. Oh, and Whistler telling Blade that he's like a son to him? Gee, I wonder what's gonna happen to him! What is it? What you were worried about? Whoa! Oh, and that's not Chris Christopherson either. And if you know the police are coming, why are you standing there stoically like an idiot? Sure enough, here come the fuzz. As Whistler starts manually enabling the self-destruct system of each of the computers, which you would have thought he'd have at the touch of a button, especially since he has shotguns literally littered around the place. This mostly serves as an excuse to get him shot at by police, so he can have a tremendously underwhelming hero's exit by sacrificing himself. So they're killing Whistler off again! Again. Bullshit! And in case you haven't seen these films, this isn't actually the first time that Whistler has been killed off. In fact, he was killed off in the first movie. And this sequence is blatantly recycled from that scene, including intruders breaking into Blade's hideout and Whistler being shot in his bad leg just like before, but at least he went out fighting vampires and losing as opposed to just armed bloody police. Adding insult to injury was the the fact the previous sequel went out of its way to bring the character back, despite this, performing such dramatic story contortions that it deserved an Olympic gold medal in plot gymnastics. And after all that effort, they kill him off unceremoniously 20 minutes into the third movie? Can you see why this is so bloody stupid? And so Blade is cornered and forced to turn himself in, which is the only convincing bit of acting that Snipes will do in the whole film. Back at Vampire HQ and Danica, who's played by Posey as more vampy than vampire, checks on Dracula, who apparently came in willingly. Yeah, that's why he decapitated someone in the opening. That makes sense. Dracula is killing his fellow vampires because, you know, he's evil. Ah, that's not very scary. Ah, Dominic Purcell! That's 
the true face of Tara! Your blood, your sacrament, can set us free now. What makes you think I care? The world's changed since your time. The humans have a new hunter, Blade. And you'd like me to kill him, wouldn't you? Yes. Quick question, why they need to dig up Dracula to kill Blade? I mean, with a camcorder and some human police, they managed to get him captured! They didn't need to dig up the master vampire because it was completely piss easy! We're subject to a long interrogation scene here, made even longer by the fact that the constant mocking of Blade is played for laughs, including psychologist Dr. Vance, played by John Michael Higgins, who if you've been following my reviews, should have become a name synonymous with Scream seemingly unfunny comic relief. Soon the vampires arrive, and in fact if they wanted to kill Blade right there and then, they probably would have got away with it too, if it weren't for some meddling kids. Evening ladies. Shouting someone's full name! So in comes Ryan Reynolds, who to comic book franchises is like what garlic is to vampires, who soon fights off the vampires to rescue Blade and bust him out. And so is Abigail, who now actually serves a purpose in the plot. Blade, you're dead! Get up! Wait, why is Triple H firing at the police? I thought he was trying to kill Blade. That's where he's an incredibly shitty shot. Blade sods off, forcing Abigail and Hannibal to fight on their own. And what's their big escape strategy? Just run right out the front door with no one in their way! Ingenious. Blade promptly returns with his sword, and they just ride off with a fellow vampire hunter, with none of the police giving chase, except for Triple H, who Abigail simply knocks out with an arrow to the eye. Why didn't Abigail shoot him with one of those UV arrows? that she used in the last scene? Because we need for the climax, stupid! Thought the vampires killed Whistler's family. They did. I was born later out of wedlock. When I came of age, I tracked my dad down and I told him I wanted in. Been doing it ever since. Okay, leaving aside the fact this completely contradicts Whistler's backstory, are we meant to believe that he was training both her and Blade at the same time and yet they never even met each other? Yeah, so much for Blade being like a son to him. So Hannibal and Abigail are part of a group known as the Night Stalkers, and they want Blade to join them. What, you amateurs are supposed to be helping me? Look at you, your kids. The fuck is wrong with you? You think this is a joke? You think this is a fucking sitcom? And you know what? He's exactly right! The Night Stalkers are a clear attempt to appeal to a younger audience with a lot more dumb humour, and it feels like a bunch of wannabes that aren't even taking this seriously. I mean, writing fuck you messages to vampires? Real mature. It's been established that Blade's superhuman abilities are how he can take on vampires in fights, and yet we have a bunch of 20-somethings who maybe dab hands with a gun or a bow and arrow, but are both human and vulnerable. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Blade having sidekicks, but they need to be on par with him, not a bunch of people who wouldn't look out of place on the Halloween issue of GQ magazine. But it's okay, because apparently Hannibal used to be a vampire, as you can see right above his pubic hair. He's extreme to the max. Also extreme is how they pointlessly have cameras on their guns as Hannibal and Danica are exes. Her name is Danica Talos. And unlike typical vampires, her fangs are located in her vagina. Which means a lot of bitter misogyny from the already charming Ryan Reynolds! Yay! You must be wondering at this point, what exactly has Dracula done in this film? Well, we're up to the 45 minute mark and so far he's sat in a room a lot. But after the vampires have lost Blade, he's finally taking charge by walking down a street like a bloody model. Truly intimidating. Oh, and he's not Dracula, he's Drake, like some fecking hipster douchebag. Hey, how dare you? Dracula can be as hunky as he likes. After all, isn't sex a key part of vampire lore? And also, why aren't you reviewing this film with me? I mean, didn't I review the first Blade movie? Yep, I was kind of waiting for you to show up, and to be honest, and I mean no offense by this, but uh, I kind of want to be like Blade on this one, you know, without sidekicks. Well, tough. You're stuck with me now. Ah, oh, shit. So Dracula wanders into a shop where they sell vampire-related paraphernalia, and Dracula is not 
happy. Then again, I wouldn't be either if my likeness were plastered all over cereal boxes, farting dolls, and vibrators. But still, the store owners seem like my kind of people. People who are fat. And this is the worst thing that Dracula does throughout the entire film. He kills a bunch of goths. Yeah, a real mess society there. Isn't that right, Maven? <laughs> bye bye. Ad break. We're still trying to sort out back from fiction when it comes to Dracula. Turning into mist? Kinda doubt it. With general shape-shifting? Maybe. Not into a bat or a wolf or anything like that, but another human with practice could be possible. Be because he wouldn't have a, a traditional skeletal structure, something more like a snake's with thousands of uh, tiny bones. And... I have a question about that, Hedges. Have you ever been laid? Oh, shut the hell up, Van Wilder. That had nothing to do with what you were talking about. And quit picking on Patton Oswalt anyway. He's funnier than you are. So how are the Night Stalkers going to fight the vampires? Well, they've got a plan. Wipe them all out biologically. And the blind Summerfield, played by Natasha Lyonne, has been trying to create such a weapon. For the last year, I've been working with synthesized DNA in order to create an artificial virus targeted specifically at vampires. We're calling it Daystar. So what's been holding you back. The bottom line is we need a better strand of DNA to work with. We need Dracula's blood. We get his blood. We can boost Daystar's viral efficacy to 100%. All the vampires go bye bye. Really? Just wipe them all out in one final move? It's just that simple. Oh, and if we can cure vampires, shouldn't we be exploring a weapon that, you know, doesn't make them vampires? Or is that a stupid option to pursue? So we have a montage of them beating up familiars, which are the Renfields of the vampire world that do their dirty work in the daytime. One of them leads them to Dr. Vance, who is another familiar, and they make an impossibly discreet entrance, considering that at least one of them is a wanted criminal. They get in to see Vance, only to discover that he's dead and Drake took his place Place because, uh... Oh, look, an action scene! Van Wilder instantly gets captured by Drake and then stabbed before Drake jumps out the window and Blade is the only one who can chase after him. See what I mean? They're both human and inexperienced, and that means they're, quite frankly, more of a liability to Blade than a help. As you may have noticed, Drake shares Blade's ability to run around in sunlight, and they have this long chase where they run and smash through things without doing anything interesting, culminating on a rooftop, where Drake has stolen a baby. They have a just as uninteresting chit-chat where Drake disappears as Blade captures the baby. Which only begs the question, why didn't he do that in the first place? So afterwards, Van Wilder whines and moans like a pussy, and Abigail has a totally negative necessary shower scene. I had a question for you. Say we're successful, say we wipe out all the vampires. What then, huh? And somehow I don't picture you teaching karate at the local Y. He hates me, doesn't he? Yeah. I want to stress to you people who haven't seen the other Blade films that he does actually have more personality than this. He's always been a dark, brooding fellow, but he wasn't a loner who hated everyone, and he did seem to have a sense of humour. The whole stoic, I'm not talking to anyone thing, comes from Snipes' dislike of his co-stars, and it makes his character feel even more marginalised, because he doesn't even have a personality anymore. And another entirely useless sequence is this next bit, where Blade and Abigail find the chief of police, another familiar, at a huge blood farm for the vampires, where they harvest humans like cattle. It's a fantastic visual and a great bit of production design, but all that happens is that they get someone to shut it down and are completely unopposed. Absolutely nothing comes of this and no one ever speaks of it again, not even the fact that Blade kills the chief of police in this scene, which you would have thought would be important considering that they're chasing him, but nope. And the only purpose that that sequence serves is to get Abigail and Blade out of the Night Stalker's hideout because not content with recycling the idea once, Goya reuses the same idea again by having Drake disguised as Whistler for no reason, even though they've never even met, sneak past security undetected. To be fair, they deserve everything they get because they put the blind woman in charge of security! 
Whose bright idea was that? Compounding this further, who's the person wandering around when a potentially dangerous threat is stalking the place? Oh yeah, the blind woman! Totally not manufacturing scares, movie! Zoe? Good idea, Zoe! Why aren't you getting out of here too? Do you really think you're gonna win in a fight against Dracula? Newt wisely hides an event whilst her stupid mother continues to roam around despite the fact that it's blatantly obvious everyone in the place is damn well dead. Blade and Abigail return to find Summerfield dead, surprise, surprise, and Van Wilder and Newt both captured. <laughs> We've been porting the vampire gene into other species. You made a goddamn vampire Pomeranian? And why does the vampire dog have a mouth belong to one of the Reapers from Blade 2? Does anyone want to explain that? Anyone? The vampires torture Van Wilder, but I think it's more the other way around. Tell us about Blade, King. What's this weapon he's been planning? I can tell you two things. Your hairdo is ridiculous. Two, I ate a lot of garlic. And I just farted. Silent but deadly. Oh, shut the hell up. Look, I know some people found him funny in this movie, but Ryan Reynolds making semi-improvised wisecracks in almost every single scene he appears in like he's doing a bloody stand-up routine is really starting to annoy the shit out of me. Back with Abigail and Blade, training montage away! They also find a message from Summerfield telling them that she has managed to get a working strain of the Daystar virus but doesn't know if it will kill Blade as well. And they've only got one shot of it and it has to be in Drake. And just so that it feels even more like a Schumacher era Batman film, there's a superfluous suiting up montage. See, one of the things you need to know about us Night Stalkers is that when you join our club, you get all sorts of groovy little door prizes. And one of them is this nifty little tracking note surgically implanted in your body. Do you see that tickle that you're feeling in the back of your throat right now? That's atomized colloidal silver. It's being pumped through the building's air conditioning system, you cock-juggling thunder cunt! Oh crap! Oh god! <laughs> Blade smashes through the roof and deals with the vampires, rather humorously leaving Van Wilder chained. So would I, to be honest, leaving Abigail to do that instead. She then... <sighs> This is possibly one of the stupidest character traits I've ever seen. She's making playlists. She likes to listen to MP3s when she hunts. It's like her own internal soundtrack, you know? She fights battles wearing fucking earphones in her ears? Why the hell would you do that? Surely you want to hear in case someone sneaks up on you? Fucking iPod product placement! I bet she listens to My Chemical Romance as well. And Van Wilder goes up against... Dogs. Yep, he has to deal with those Resident Evil rejects. And what does he do after? He gives the finger whilst walking backwards and falls right back where he started. Nice going, numb nuts. Really earned a Green Lantern power ring for that one. So the big final battle ensues. It's Blade versus Drake, and on the other hand, Van Wilder versus Triple H, where we're somehow meant to believe that Ryan Reynolds would win despite the fact that he gets his bones ground to dust. Despite managing to vaporize the King of Kings, when it comes to fighting his ex Danica, he's useless? So he can fight a vampire wrestler twice his size no problem, but a vampire woman half his size he can't handle? Yeah, that makes sense. So Blade and Drake continue to battle, with Drake assuming monster form for no real reason. Abigail takes the Daystar shot, but Drake intercepts it, merely throwing it to the floor. So she fires a second normal shot, which Drake totally didn't see coming for some reason, and that gives enough time for Blade to stab him with the Daystar arrow, spreading the plague and killing all the vampires. Hooray for vampire genocide! I hope that those hundreds of vampires don't have friends or family. Drake, before dying, gives Blade a final spiel, telling him that the vampire race rests with him regardless, and as a passing gift, telling him that sooner or later, the thirst always wins. The police storm the building, yep, the movie finally remembered that plotline from over an hour ago, and this is where the two versions of the movie differ. The DVD version offers both the extended and the theatrical cuts of the movie, and the most 
most significant alteration between them is that they both have different endings. So let's take a look at them both. In the theatrical cut, the police find just the body of Blade, but it's shirtless. Yep, it's actually Drake's body that he changed into as a parting gift for Blade, even though that wasn't what that line meant. Blade was still out there somewhere, doing what he did best. He was a weapon, his life was a war, and everybody knows the war never ends. does all the vampires are dead at this point that war is pretty conclusively ended i think in the extended cut of the film the police storm in and once again find blade's body by itself but this time it's clothed clearly indicating that it's actually meant to be him which only begs the question what the hell happened to drake's body did abigail and van wilder drag it out why would they do that and leave blade behind once again we get the autopsy scene, but this time Blade snaps to life and fights the police and coroners, and it's left vague whether he sucks their blood. The virus didn't kill him. Because he was a hybrid, his heart never stopped beating. It simply slowed down. And so he slept, waiting for the moment when he could walk the earth again. darker ending implies that Blade might have turned, which may have had some resonance if it was set up at all in the preceding running time. Face it, both of these endings suck, and so does the film. You know, Wesley Snipes was actually right about a lot of this movie. David S. Goyer's script for the film is an absolute mess. A bunch of plot points thrown together and often forgotten about for long periods of time, with frat boy humour only making things worse. The inclusion of the Night Stalkers, obviously intended to launch Pad a spin-off, hinders the film due to their lack of credibility, especially Ryan Reynolds, who I found insufferable. Goya's direction is ropey, and the overlong running time isn't helped by loads of minor scenes that they really just should have cut. The inclusion of Dracula is a disappointment, partly due to the bad writing, and partly due to the fact that Dominic Purcell is a completely charismaless block of muscle. Even the action is weak, and it's positive anemic compared to the other two films, but Snipes himself deserves blame too. His central performance brims with obvious disdain for the film, and whilst it wouldn't have been good even on his A game, he ends up making the film implode around him. Clearly aims at a younger mainstream audience, Blade Trinity is a failure of a climax for fans of two otherwise decent films in this series. I'm Matthew Buck, beating down bad Snipes movies everywhere.